that information over, make sure it looks right? It's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to have a seat uh, in the lounge, if you will. I'll bring the loaner car around. Okay. Uh, again, two days, car should be done, and I'll give you a call. All right. See you in a couple of days. Fine. Okay. Hey, Bill. Can I borrow this for a couple minutes? Sure. I'll bring it right back. Hi. Well, I know you don't need me to tell you that one of the most useful tools in the shop is a well-written-up repair order. But when it comes to transmission complaints, a good write-up, it's more than useful. It's absolutely essential. I mean, if a car won't drive in any gear, but the engine sounds fine, well, you pretty much know where you stand, don't you? But most problems aren't quite that straightforward. And that's why we always use this uh, customer information sheet. It helps us get all the important details of the problem up front. Now, you'll find a copy of the customer information sheet in your know-how reference manual. The way a customer feels a transmission should perform is usually based on personal experience with other cars. Cars which may have had completely different powertrain combinations. It it's not smooth. I, I mean, I notice a jerkiness and when I'm going from, say, 20 to 30 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, my last car just didn't sound that way. Okay. And what, what was your last car? It was a Sable, a Mercury Sable. Sable. If at all possible, and assuming the car is drivable, the customer should be taken along on an initial road test to verify that there is a potential transmission problem. But before road testing the car, it's a good idea to check that the shift linkage is adjusted so it correctly engages all gear positions. Damaged, stuck, or misadjusted shift linkage can cause internal transmission leakage. With the engine fully warmed up and running, fluid level should be checked to ensure there is sufficient fluid in the trans to conduct a road test without causing further damage. It's usually best if the customer drives while the service advisor observes the car's behavior, listens for unusual noises, and watches for any driving habits that could cause the complaint, like a hand resting on the shift lever while driving. That could cause downshifting. Looks good, straight ahead. Now, once a possible transmission concern has been verified, the next job is to find the source of the complaint. Diagnostic procedures will vary, of course, depending on the nature and extent of the problem. As you know, symptoms that seem at first to be internal transmission problems are often actually caused by an external condition. For instance, a stuck or incorrectly adjusted TV cable can cause delayed early or harsh upshifts or even no upshifts. Engine performance and drivability symptoms are very often misdiagnosed as transmission problems. Things like chuggle, surge, shutter, or even lack of power. Now you might say, if engine performance was off enough to affect the transmission, you'd notice it. Well, maybe, but drivability problems aren't always that obvious. Now this is largely because the engine or powertrain control module on today's Buicks do a great job of compensating for engine problems. And as a result, basic problems like a broken spark plug, a plug fuel injector, a vacuum leak, or a blocked vacuum line may go unnoticed. That is, most of the time. A misfiring spark plug or a restricted fuel injector problem may only become really noticeable as a shutter when the torque converter is engaged and the engine is under load. Anyway, the point is, you'd feel pretty bad if you removed the transaxle only to find that a bad spark plug was the cause of the complaint. But believe me, it happens. Sometimes, just listening to the engine under acceleration is enough to spot a performance problem. However, since most transmissions rely on engine vacuum for proper operation, a vacuum gauge should be used to ensure that adequate manifold vacuum is present at the modulator connector. The gauge should drop instantly when the throttle is quickly opened and recover as soon as the engine returns to idle. Fluid found in the vacuum line while performing the vacuum test indicates the modulator is leaking fluid into the engine and should be replaced. If after the vacuum test there's still any doubt about engine performance, a scan tool should be used to check the ECM or PCM data display. The first thing to check for is a trouble code indicating a condition that may affect engine performance and transmission operation. 
any current trouble codes must be corrected before continuing to diagnose a transmission problem. Now, if no trouble codes are present, the scan data should be examined for any out-of-range readings, anything that might indicate that the control module is compensating for a problem. For example, a vacuum leak or intake manifold leak may be indicated by fuel integrator and block learn readings, which are both above the normal range for the engine. High readings could indicate that the leak is causing the oxygen sensor to signal a lean condition and the ECM is adding fuel to compensate. The scan tool is also particularly useful for diagnosing torque converter clutch related complaints. Don't forget, when testing TCC in the garage, the front suspension must be properly supported for off-ground running. As the car is operated, the scan tool is used to observe TCC apply and release signals from the control module. Also, actual TCC engagement can be verified by watching the scan tool for a drop in RPM when the ECM signals the clutch solenoid to apply. The scan tool can also be used to monitor signals from the transaxle's internal gear switches. The ECM or PCM uses these signals for TCC operation. On most cars, the release signal from the brake switch to the TCC can also be monitored. If the TCC doesn't release during braking, the engine may shudder and eventually stall as the car stops. Other components which may affect TCC operation are the throttle position sensor, the coolant temperature sensor, and the vehicle speed sensor. Of course, if the car is a late model equipped with the new 4T60E electronically controlled transaxle, the scan tool can be used for more extensive diagnosis of the transaxle and PCM. Now, let's assume that all engine performance and electrical problems, fluid, TV cables, and other external causes have been eliminated as the source of the complaint. The next job is to isolate the internal trans components that are causing the problem. Now, as much diagnosis and testing as possible must be completed before the trans is removed from the car. For example, diagnosing a shift feel or timing complaint would typically include a road test to record the shift point speeds. The results of the road test are compared with the chart in the service manual to determine where a shift speed problem occurs. A line pressure check can be used to measure oil pressure output from the pump in each gear range as the engine is operated at a specified RPM. This test can be used to monitor the functions of the pressure regulator, TV system, and reverse boost valve. Line pressure check procedures and pressure specs can be found in the service manual. Service bulletins are also a very important part of transaxle repair and diagnosis. Bulletins keep you informed about revised service procedures, new replacement parts, and engineering updates designed to improve transmission serviceability, performance, and durability. However, Service bulletin procedures should not be performed unless it's certain that the conditions described in the bulletin fully apply to the year and model transmission or transaxle being serviced. When a thorough diagnosis clearly identifies that the complaint is caused by internal components, well, then it's time to examine the trans for further confirmation. The bottom pan must be removed carefully so some of the fluid and any material in it is retained. Fluid in the pan should be examined to see if it's burnt or contaminated with water, coolant, or debris, which indicates excessive wear or damage. Pink colored fluid, resembling a strawberry shake, indicates contamination with water or coolant. A trans contaminated with antifreeze must be removed and disassembled for cleaning, and all seals, line clutch plates, and bands must be replaced. If an excessive amount of metal particles, rubber, or clutch lining material is found in the pan, the filter should be removed and checked for further debris. If the filter contains a heavy accumulation of metal or clutch material, the trans should be disassembled and the suspected parts should be examined for damage or excessive wear. When the trans must be disassembled, 
internal components should be carefully inspected to distinguish which parts need to be replaced and which can be reused. Now I know when a trans is on the bench, there's always a temptation to replace parts just because you got it all apart anyway. But let's face it, replacing more parts than are required to make a good repair using insurance parts, as some of us like to call them, really benefits no one. All it does is increase repair costs and can lead to an unhappy customer if the parts replaced aren't justified by the repair. The torque converter is a good example of a component that's commonly replaced unnecessarily. A converter pilot should be checked for damage or scoring that could cause an improper fit on the shaft. The pump should also be checked. If the pump is damaged, fluid flow carries metal debris from the pump into the torque converter. The torque converter should be examined for blue discoloration caused by overheating and for heavy scoring or other damage. As much fluid as possible should be drained from the converter and checked for excessive aluminum deposits or other contamination. By the way, a converter contaminated with antifreeze should be replaced because the internal clutch linings will be damaged. A large amount of metal particles in the converter oil often indicates an internal failure, such as the clutch not locking or damaged thrust washers. The stator roller clutch can be checked by manually turning the splined inner race. It should rotate easily only to the right. If the inner race is stuck or turns freely in both directions, the converter should be replaced. A freewheeling stator one-way roller clutch usually causes poor acceleration from a standstill and then appears normal when speed rises above 30 or 35 miles per hour. When there is no obvious torque converter damage, a dial indicator should be used with the appropriate special tool to check converter end play. If the measured end play exceeds half a millimeter, the converter should be replaced. The same kind of careful examination that we just saw on the converter should be used on all suspect components. Okay, now let's look at the car that came in earlier. The complaint was rough TCC applied. Having used the scan tool to rule out electrical TCC problems, a rough apply condition could indicate a fault in the control valve hydraulic circuits. The fluid flow chart may be used to check the location and function of the valves and check balls in the affected circuit. In this case, a stuck converter clutch regulator valve seems in fact to be the cause of the rough TCC apply. Dennis is able to repair this condition by cleaning the valve and bore, removing any varnish or sediment deposit that caused it to stick. Always check for repairable problems, like sticking valves, broken springs, and missing or damaged check balls, before condemning the assembly. Also, check channel plates and spacer plates for peening, caused by the check ball hitting the plate hard. The check ball may actually become lodged in an indentation caused by peening. Of course, warped or damaged valve body assemblies should be replaced. And clutch assemblies and bands should be examined for scores or discoloration from overheating. Undamaged steel clutch plates with smooth surfaces and an even color can be reused. Some heat discoloration is normal. Plates that aren't flat or that show severe heat spot damage or surface scuffing should be replaced. If there's evidence of burning or extreme heat in the clutch, the springs should also be replaced. Similarly, composition plates should be replaced when they're warped, charred, glazed, pitted, or have metal particles embedded in the lining. If the print on the lining is still visible and the lining material is firm, the plate can be reused. When an examination indicates that a transaxle requires major repairs with a large number of replacement parts, an estimate should be made of the total cost of the parts and labor. This figure should then be compared to the local cost of installing a service replacement transmission assembly, or CERTA unit. If the individual parts expense is greater than or very close to the CERTA cost, 
then the SERTA unit should be installed. A SERTA unit should be considered when an original 1985 or 1986 4T60 transaxle with no previous record of repair needs extensive repair. A SERTA replacement for these models incorporates a large number of updated components which if installed separately could end up costing more than the replacement unit. Now, there has been a slight change in the paperwork requirements when a CERTA is installed. There are two copies of the CERTA worksheet. The additional copy must be filed with the repair order. And finally, no transmission repair or replacement job is complete until the oil cooler is thoroughly flushed. Cooler flushing is a must for quality repair. That's why it's included in all trans repair times in the labor time guide. I know you probably heard this a million times, but if you don't flush the oil cooler and check for restricted flow, you could very quickly undo all the good work you've done. Now, as I said earlier, transmission repair isn't always straightforward, but with a good write-up and a logical diagnostic procedure, you should be able to resolve most complaints and keep your customers happy.